Tales from the Wild. Stories from the Heart. A journey into the mind and soul of fired up business professionals where they share their vision for the future. And hear from a different non profit organization every month as they create awareness of their goals and their needs. Dive into a world of untamed passion as we join our host, Shireen Buerta, for this month's episode of Friends from Wild Places. If you don't mind just touching on this a little bit. So initially, do you find people sometimes like they don't want to bring it up because they don't want to upset you as if as if you're not thinking about this in your own thoughts initially? Do you know what I mean? Like, let's say you haven't seen somebody in a while, like, and it's like this awkward, like, they may not want to bring it up to think that they're bringing you back to that moment, but you live your life probably every moment of that. Is that, can you share, shed some light on that? Yeah. I, I'm glad that you mentioned that Tanya, because that is something I, when I was a mortician, I always remembered the families who lost a child. I don't know why those things just really stick with you. Um, And even when I'd see them out in the community, my brain always was like, Oh, those are the parents that lost the child. You kind of like label them that way. And right away, I was like, I don't want to be the parent who lost the child, you know, like I'm more than that. Um, But um, I think, um, so I'm sorry, what was your original question? I just trailed off a minute. No worries, no worries. No, it just like, for example, so like, let's say you haven't seen somebody in a while, right? Oh, and- oh, you were asking if people bring, if when people bring up Ted. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so what I was getting at was I, I, I remember thinking about families kind of the wrong way because I would think about that, like, oh, they're the parent who lost the child and like, maybe not mention that. Um, but for me, it, the most refreshing thing that happened was when I joined a mops group, a moms of preschoolers after Ted died, after I had more kids and somebody asked me about what it was like when Ted was little. And I was like, Thank you. You recognize the fact that I had a baby for two, almost two years. And you're actually acknowledging that experience because yes, he died, but I still was his mom for two years. And we still dealt with, you know, uh, all of those things, every new, every mom, you know, deals with. Um, So, you know, I think more than anything, it's refreshing when people remember them, especially when they're young, because you fear people will forget them because they weren't on this planet very long. Right, right, right. One of my, um, um, you may be familiar with um, Glenda Stansberry from Inside yes. Institute Celebrant Training. And I remember having gone through that program uh, many years ago, probably like 2008 or nine. And I remember, you know, in, in that um, like instruction that I received and I really like took it to heart was that Sometimes if you bring up something to somebody and they get emotional or, you know, maybe shed some tears, it you're not making them cry, right? Sometimes it's like, you know, they're just sometimes even happy that you brought it up. But I think as a society, especially in the United States, like we really don't know how to handle grief as far as talking to people with grief. I mean, it's like, okay, if somebody has a funeral, we kind of can understand, you know, we go to the funeral and maybe, you know, sign the guest book and, you know, accept extend condolences to the family. But what do you do three weeks later when you do see these folks at the grocery store or, you know, you run into them at the gas station? It's like, do you bring it up? Do you not bring it up? So I just, you know, I just so appreciate your, you know, just authenticity with sharing, like, you know, the emotions as far as, you know, that it is comforting if somebody asks you about Ted, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, like, oh, we should avoid the topic because we don't want to upset you. So um, anything else that you want to share with us and our listeners as far as, you know, like the, the grief side of your journey? Um, and it, I, I never made the connection, Janet, that that when you um, when 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 Ted passed, you were not in the, the funeral home at that time. Like you were not working. Yeah, as I, a I never made that. I connection. wasn't. Yeah, I had after I got my MBA, I decided to um, let my funeral home license or my mortuary license lapse. And so I was not a licensed mortician. I hadn't been working for probably, I don't know, 10 years, maybe maybe eight years in the field. It had been a long time. Um, Yeah, I think the only other thing that I would say about that about losing Ted 
that was eye-opening to me is there is something about, and I'd say this to all the parents out there who, even if you, um, I don't want to say even if, because that's not the right word. If you have been in a situation where your child was injured or killed from a dangerous product on the market um, or a home accident, it's so easy to believe that you're responsible, that you, um, to shame yourself. Um, and there's probably always going to be a part of me that wonders what could I, you know, I, I should have anchored his furniture to the wall. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute about, you know, what I did with, with the information I had. Um, but I think what was the most helpful for me was to just get, reach a point um, where I can't change what happened. Mm -hmm. I learned from it. Um, and the the best thing that I can do is um, to spread awareness and um, to help other people so that this doesn't happen again to the best of my ability. Um, and to, uh, I saw how many parents that this happened to and through um, through social media and through the internet, how publicly shamed they were um, from people who didn't know the scenario. And it's not even tip over parents, but I worked with other, other, other parents, um, you know, and parents who, you know, lost kids with, from window blinds or left kids in hot cars or things where it's like you, you have to understand there's nothing that you as a stranger could tell these people that they haven't already told themselves. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And so if, if you want to, um, if you want to live your life um, harassing a bereaved parent online, I guess that's your choice. But um, um, is that helpful? Um, I would say no. Um, and it's something that, that parents, um, the parents are having to grapple with that um, themselves. And I think the only way to help people heal from that is um, through love and not shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I so just... Janet, with that, I would love you just to, to go into the next part of your story of your journey after this incident. You know, what happened? Sure. So about four days after Ted died, I was sitting on the floor in his bedroom and one of my friends had come over <clears throat> and she said, well, this wasn't an Ikea dresser, was it? And I said, it was, but I don't know what that has to do with anything. And she said, well, um, I just... I was telling my coworker about Ted and she said something about Ikea dressers being unstable. And I was like, I don't know. So I'm sitting on the floor of my dead son's bedroom and I Google Ikea dresser deaths. And the first thing that pops up is his dresser, his exact dresser. And I find out that day that it killed two other kids two years before him. And I find out that there had been a, not a recall, but a repair kit program that was issued through the Consumer Product Safety Commission seven months before he died, where IKEA said they didn't recall the product, but they said this this dresser is um, dangerous if it's not anchored to the wall. So contact us and we'll send you an anchor kit in the mail. Um, and so, but what I know now is that Ted was the eighth child to die from an IKEA dresser. And there were two other kids that died a year after him. And actually, he was one of 500 people who had died in the last two decades since the year 2000 from um, a dresser or TV falling um, on someone. 90% of these deaths were toddlers. Um, uh, uh, the other high percentage, around 10%, were elderly. Um, if you think elderly have trouble, fall risk, you go to grab a dresser, the, you know, the dresser comes down with them. Um, but often as I submitted a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act, so I could actually see these in-depth investigations, these IDIs, it takes forever. And in fact, I filed one, gosh, five years ago, and I still haven't gotten a completed uh, request. Um, it's a very slow process, but, um, you know, some of these a lot of the ones we looked at are such similar situations to ours where a parent put the child down for a nap um, or um, to for bed at night and went to go check on them at nap time or went to go wake them up in the morning and found them under their dresser. Um, and they didn't hear anything because their body absorbed the noise of the fall. Um, and so 
uh, what we ended up doing was, and again, I, Tanya, I attribute it to our background, you know, as a mortician and just kind of that compassion, but um, reaching out, found people on Facebook, um, just Google, Googling, Googling newspaper articles, Googling tip over deaths, um, finding, finding their names, finding them on social media, reaching out and say like, this happened to me. I heard it happened to you. Let me know if you want to talk. Um, you know, and eventually found uh, several groups of parents who were willing to talk. And I found out that several of these parents had actually been trying to spread awareness of tip overs for almost, you know, 10 plus years before Ted's death. Um, so they're kind of unilaterally you know, spreading awareness in their own states and in their own areas. Um, but nothing had really changed. Um, and so, and the other thing I'll say is, as we got more and more into this advocacy, we realized this was not just an IKEA problem. Um, we realized that they just didn't have a lot of completed data. So the data that we did have showed a lot of IKEA, but most of the data that we had did not show what type of dresser it was. So the manufacturers we were finding, there was a lot of finger pointing going on. Like, well, you, we, and I understand that from a business perspective, how do you, how do you justify making billions of dollars worth of changes in your product line um, or millions of dollars, depending on how big your, your, you know, company is um, without data to back up your, the change, right? I mean, I, I understand that completely. So um, I see the I see saw the problem that we were in, but the reality is that we have all these anecdotal stories and no data to back up what's happening. Um, but we need to stop turning a blind eye to this to all these children that are dying. So anyway, we formed um, a parent group called Parents Against Tip Overs. Um, Pat, we call ourselves, but there is a group originally of about I want to say nine or so families where we all lost children. And we were from all over the country. We were from Massachusetts and Missouri and um, Florida and uh, Washington, the state of Washington and Chicago, um, Arkansas. Um, uh, where was the other? Oh, New York. I mean, we were kind of all over the place. I'm in Minnesota um, and we, basically got together and we flew out to Washington, D.C. and met with the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And um, we tried to make it as easy for them as possible. I mean, we made table tents, like, here's our name. Here's where we're from. This is a picture of my child. We need you to hear our whole stories chronologically. This is what's happening. And we really approached it as we're not here waving our finger at you saying what you did wrong. We're saying um, this is just truth, okay? This is what is happening. Um, what can you do about this truth? Mm -hmm. You know, what say you? <laughs> um, and what was refreshing, you know, looking back uh, years later is the, he's retired now, but the former um, commissioner, uh, Bob Adler said, you know, you are one of the most well-organized parent groups I'd ever worked with because yeah. Yeah. you came to us with data, you know, you came to us not pointing fingers, but wanting to solve a problem. And you came to us with your, with your stories. Um, and it wasn't just about your tears. So many times, you know, you hate to say it, but like as a government agency, you hear families crying with their tears and their emotions, which is horrible and hard to listen to, I'm sure, and heartbreaking and you wanna change it. But if you don't have data to back up how to make changes, it can be very difficult. You know, So um, my understanding from what he told us is that was one of the ways we were so effective was because we kind of had both. We had kind of the logical and reasoning, but we also had our stories that, um, that brought that change. Right. Right, right. Unbelievable. That. It's just amazing, though, just the, you know, the advocacy portion. So um, a couple of questions I have for you, Janet. So as far as, you know, bereavement, right, a lot of funeral homes offer like aftercare or support groups. So has, has there been any um, initiative for funeral homes to offer um, this type of support group for families who may have child who has passed from accidents 
or or the you know tip tip over type of uh, situations Be, you know what i mean like for example like there's like the SIDS group I'm aware of. We have like in Florida, there's different advocacy groups here. But I just wonder um, from like a national perspective or even international for that matter, what what is your thought as far as, you know, promoting the these type of bereavement groups or grief, grief supports for families that have children that have died that they don't they don't really know where to go like you know what i mean like somebody that passed of cancer that's 90 it's sad but it's a different type of grief right it's a different type of situation so can you shed any light as far as you know how far that initiative on the bereavement side has gone i think i think it's needed um in fact i think that that I think most of the parents in our Parents Against Tip Overs group could speak to the fact that we were each other's rocks, you know, um, especially when you have social media and people saying bad, you know, bad things um, like, why aren't you watching your kids or any, you know, we had to stick together and you have to, when, when someone says like, this guy, this guy's an a-hole, he said this, you know, we were a group where you could vent to, to say, you know, honey, they're saying that because if they say it out loud, that means it'll never happen to them. You know, it's a it's a way that they're protecting themselves. It's a way that they're protecting their kids. You know, we just kind of had to bring that. We, we talked to each other kind of off the ledge. Um, and I think I don't have I mean, Pat opens ourselves up to talk to families who have lost kids from tip overs because, you know, I'm a mortician and one of the other parents in our group is a death doula. Um, but but. But as far as um, if there's a formal organization that supports parents who have lost children from products, there's not one. And I would love to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I mean, you're just an amazing, amazing, like person, mm -hmm. humans. I mean, I just, you know, I, I just can't speak enough about you as far as, you know, what you've experienced, been through um, and just sharing, you know, Ted's story and his journey. So right. um, absolutely. And I do, sorry, I just have another question for you. Um, if you had to do everything over again, what is the one thing that you would change? Have you thought about that? Um, I mean, of course, Ted would be alive. That would be the I one thing. <laughs> but, um, but you know, as far as the whole process and how it went down, um, I mean, I guess I'm just a firm believer in everything happens the way that it's supposed to. I mean, I I think that one, you know, one one speaking engagement led to another, and one introduction led to another and one relationship led to another relationship being built which led to another relationship being built and I think that's the beauty of life is when we can just kind of surrender um, to how things unfold naturally um, we can take the weight off of ourselves and it feels actually pretty freeing um, that we don't have to do anything we can just be and um, it will happen the way it's supposed to happen. Very good yeah, answer. I, mean, I like that one. <laughs> but yeah, it's so true what you said. So, so true. Things just happen the way it should. And yes, it's very easy for us. And there's nothing wrong with looking back and going, oh, I could have done this a little bit better. Um, I learned from this, so I could have changed that a little bit in the way. Of so there's nothing wrong with that. But I do like your answer in the sense of, you know, what, everything happens for a reason. I think this is exactly how everything mm -hmm. should have turned out. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Jenna. Yeah. Jenna, I, thought, I, I believe you, we had spoken previously um, about initially it was um, and I don't want to put words. I don't want to project words for you, but I think it was, you know, again, like this, you know, it's like Ikea made this dresser and now we're you know going to investigate. And then now you actually serve on their advisory board. Is that correct? Or, or with them? I don't I don't serve on their advisory board. But what happened was something incredibly beautiful again. We don't, we don't choose, you know, where to go, but I think things just lead us to where we're supposed to be. Yeah. Um, what happened was, um, I, in the end, I'm very impressed with how Ikea handled this situation. Um, I said from the beginning, I'm not here to throw this company under the bus. I just want them to take ownership of this problem um, because um, it's happening and and what I've learned is that, you know, the company 
um, knew that it was happening. And uh, I believe we're trying to make changes. Um, and we all, myself included, you know, we did, we didn't know what that looked like. You know, this is such an, you know, and, and I think that's the, that's the power of vulnerability right. um, to be able to sit. I mean, I, Ikea reached out to me and other parents at Parents Against Tip Overs and said, you know, we want to help you pass the sturdy act. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to support this legislation. We want to be part of the solution. Right. Um, and I respect them for that. And so we met every week for almost two years to strategize and um, try to get the Sturdy Act passed. We reintroduced it three times. Um, and COVID was in the middle of that too. So of course our country was busy uh, doing more important things <laughs> during that time, but uh, we eventually did get it passed. And, um, and Ikea was a big part of that. And to this day, you know, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm proud um, to be part of what they've worked on. I mean, um, they developed a new system where you can, um, you open one drawer, it's an interlocking drawer system. So you open one drawer and the rest of the drawers remain locked. So you can only open one drawer at a time. Um, but if you were to anchor it to the wall, it will uh, release the system. So you can open all of the drawers at once as long as it's anchored to the wall. Right. Um, and they actually did a patent pledge last October in 2023 to release that um, to the public. Right. So, uh, so they, they said, you know, this, we believe this innovation is life changing. We want other people to use it. Um, and so they released that patent to the public, which I thought said a lot about where their, you know, what their intentions were. Um, they've redesigned a lot of their dressers. Um, and of course, now with the Sturdy Act, uh, the Stop Tip Overs of Unstable Risky Dressers on Youth Act, now it requires manufacturers um, to build, uh, to adhere to a stronger and mandatory safety standard. Mm -hmm. um, so they have to take um, some additional uh, elements into their uh, into safety, into designing safety into their dressers. Mm -hmm. So they have to consider, you know, what it what does it mean when the when there's actually clothing in the in the unit instead of it being empty when we test it? Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean if it's slightly elevated because it's maybe on carpet? Um, there's carpet tack that runs along the perimeter of the room and it, is the back of the dresser slightly elevated? Um, and does that make it more susceptible to tip? Um, instead of testing everything on, you know, like a concrete floor in a lab, um, empty, you know, it's not how we use dressers um, as consumers. We use them a lot of times on carpet and we have things in them because that's what they're designed to do. Um, and we teach our kids to use dressers and interact with them. So, um, you know, it might be that kids are opening, you know, one, two, three drawers at a time. Um, and if that's not safe to do, then why are they designed that way? Mm -hmm. Love right. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, now, but we, we've got to move on to the nonprofit section of the podcast. Um, sure. But I do have a question about your business. Do you want to talk a little bit about it, your LLC? And um, sure. how are you, you know, changing the community with your business? Yeah. So I'm kind of in the middle of a transition right now because for several years, I used my LLC um, called The Lifted, short for The Life of Ted, and I used it to spread furniture tip over awareness. So I would go and speak about um, the dangers of unanchored furniture. And I'd go to mom's groups. I'd go to Babies R Us, to CPR classes, to basically whoever would listen um, and just say, you know, um, I'm just going to give you some information. You do with it what you will. I can't, I can't make you anchor your furniture, but um, I just want to tell you my story. Um, and then I had anchor kits, you know, for people. And, um, and so I did that. I um, was able to uh, partner with Children's Hospital here in Minneapolis. So we um, worked together um, on a, a couple projects and, Anyway, it was it was really good. But, you know, once Sturdy got passed, I thought, well, now I'm going to get into teaching. I got this opportunity to teach at the Mortuary Science Program. And um, so I began thinking, you know, what do I want to do with this LLC? 
And so now I'm in the process of kind of rebranding it. I still want to keep the name, the, the lifted, the life of Ted. And I now I want to. Um, I'm, I'm working on creating continuing ed for funeral professionals to continue using Ted's um, story to um, invest in the funeral profession. Tune in next week for part three of Friends from Wild Places. You've been listening to Friends from Wild Places with Shireen Bueta. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast from the links to catch every episode and unleash your passion.